Mike has allowed me to read the text uh, this morning, so I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> I'm reading out of the King James Version, so I, I stumble around there a little bit, but we're in 1 Samuel 16, and we're in uh, verses 15 through 23. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Thank you, Seth. Uh, you're qualified to go to seminary. You uh, can preach, pray, or die at any moment. He, he just jumped right in. He asked me, should I read the text? Absolutely, you should read the text. Uh, well, Merry Christmas, everyone. This is my last uh, meeting here this year at Believer's Chapel, so I want to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas uh, I have brought a few more uh, delighted in God, the uh, story of George Mueller. If you didn't get one in the past, there's a few left. Uh, this is our uh, sixth lesson in our study, the uh, Rise of David, a king without a kingdom. And in our last lesson, which primarily focused on verse 14, we audited the man Saul, who became the first king of Israel. We looked at God's judgment upon him by the sovereignty of God. And that effect upon not only the man, but upon all of Israel as well. And then we discussed what did we learn as believers today uh, as a result of His judgment. Now today, we move on in our narrative beginning in verse 15. And as I've pointed out in the past, the narrative is framed by the word depart, verse 14 and verse 23. So we have the top and the bottom of a frame, and we are analyzing, scrutinizing all of the revelation that God would give us in between those two points. Today, we're going back to our key words. Uh, let me give you just a short tutorial on key words in a biblical narrative from the Old Testament. They are words that may appear numerous times in a text. That tells us we have a key word. But oftentimes, they are below the surface of the reading. In other words, God, or the inspired writer, uh, moved by God, puts these words in very subtly to carry the narrative, to tell us more of the story than we would 
just get on the surface. So uh, the key words for our text this morning are to see, the verb to see, and the verb to send. We'll look at those again in some detail. So here is our exposition beginning in verse 15. And of note here regarding the man Saul, his new condition is obviously become recognizable in some form or fashion. His mood, we'll just call it that, has darkened. Saul had abandoned the Lord and the consequences of that the Lord has abandoned Saul. Verse 14, we have the word terrorize, and here it is tormenting. A fine scholar Daniel Block tells us not to make too much out of the difference between the two words. To me personally, verse 14, terrorize invokes the idea of initial strike, and whereas terrorize gives us the idea of the condition has now firmly set in or taken hold upon the man. It's a part of him and his personality. Notice the word evil. It's not for a moral effect, but rather this is the observable uh, phenomenon that has taken place within Saul. Misery, distress, sadness. And a remedy, therefore, must be found for such an important man. Now, verse 16, these attending servants we are to understand as high-ranking officials, advisors to the king in the king's presence. And here is the advice that they give him. Seek out a man, a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. It was believed in the culture of the ancient Near East that music had some kind of divine power. Music would be good for Saul in his condition. We need to find a musical therapist. Good music to cheer the man. So literally, it is let our Lord speak, or we have in English, give us the command, and it is to find the skillful. Now here the word means to know. Someone that can make an instrument come alive, really. It's one thing to know how to play an instrument. It's quite another to perform or transition that instrument with skill and ability. I drove once, I think, my first year or second year with a group of students to hear Van Cliburn in Fort Worth. What a gift that man had. That's pretty heady stuff for a guy that knew nothing about classical music. That was me. But let's step back now, verse 15 and 16, and get our minds around what has just taken place. A position has just opened up. And like every position, every position, every opportunity, every, the author is the Lord God of heaven and earth. Did you obtain the position that you interviewed for? No, I didn't. Well, don't be discouraged. God places His people strategically where they are for His own purpose. So consider, consider this serious position He has given you today, where you are. He alone has placed you there. Work there in excellence, and you'll be observed for your proficiency, and all of that is to the glory of God. Nothing is a bigger downer than a Christian that is not functional in his position. 
It's a disgrace. <clears throat> if you don't have a position, then volunteer. Become a volunteer out there. Let people get to know you and see the skills, the proficiency with which you operate. Believe me, they will see your value. And God will be glorified in that and opportunities will come. The world is always begging for competence on some level. Now, here we get into our key word, verse 17. And here it is in the narrative. Saul says, and this is a literal translation, see for me. Now, we don't communicate that way. That's not the way the English language functions. We say find, we say provide, provide for me. But this is the same verb that we've had that's run throughout the narrative. It is the verb with a preposition tied to it. And the nuance from that is the word to find. Find for me. Here's the reason I want to emphasize the verb to see. Because look back at verse 1. The Lord says to Samuel, I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. Here's your verb. For I have seen. Now here's the command of Saul. See, we say find, find for me of this certain person. Well, who's he looking for? And this is why I emphasize the key word to see. Because he's looking for the very man that's going to replace him. The man that Samuel anointed, that God had identified and sent Samuel to anoint as the next king of Israel. See, everything in Bible study is important. All the little nuances and the details. I am a big proponent in reading through the Bible in a year. But reading through the Bible is not studying the Bible. It was one of the great privileges of my life to be in a classroom with S. Lewis Johnson and he opened the inspired language and he took you meticulously through the details of a passage and showed you what was actually being said and grammatically why it was being said that way. It lifted the text off the page. That's Bible study. So let's remember this. Everything in Bible study is important. All the details. This is God's breathed word out and its appearance in the text is all ordered by Him, even where the words are, and so forth. Why? Why? Why is that essential to our thinking? Because it keeps us sharp mentally. We fill our minds with the details of the Word of God, and it keeps those things rotating in and out of our minds all day long. The upshot of all this, seeing the man that Saul sought is the very man that God had identified in the first place to replace him. Derek Kidner, the Cambridge scholar, in his commentary on Proverbs, had a very pithy insight into Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 20.
Here's 1220 of Proverbs. Deceit is in the heart of those who plot evil, but those who promote peace find joy. Here's the pithy comment of the brilliant Kidner. The plans you shape, shape you. So we ask, okay, Saul, you're out looking for someone to play for you, to be in your close company with you. But you have no idea what the Lord is doing in that request at all. That's why we as believers need to pray for guidance and direction. And that's why we do so every day. That the Lord would lead us every day on the straight way, on the straight path before us. We are shaping our day by following His guidance and direction for our lives. I had a Christian from another city. He texted me this past week. He had, he had had considerable success in business, and he asked the question, how does a man make sure that money does not have him? but he has the money to use for the kingdom. I text him back, Psalm 139, verse 22, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my anxious thoughts. And if there's any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. Always keep open dialogue with God about your thoughts and the intentions of your heart. Why? The plans you shape, shape you. Now verse 18, let's mark this well. We could almost sound a trumpet here in the text. Here is the providence of God. Now, let me define that for you. I know I have in the past you might not have heard it. The sovereignty of God is His absolute control over everything from A to Z. He has it all planned out in detail. But the providence of God is the how of that sovereignty. How all of those pieces fit together. This is providence put on full display. How does a man like David get into the inner circle of a man like Saul? Well, here we go. Look how this officer speaks. I have seen. That's too good, isn't it? That's her key word. I've seen. It's the same phrase that God uses back in verse 1. Sending Samuel to the house of Jesse. I have seen. We want to ask, where did you see? How did you see? What was the occasion you saw? But if we're really thinking theologically, his observation on that day that he saw, on that occasion that he saw, could not have been missed at all. Just simply couldn't. Things appear as random or accidental. We say, lucky, lucky. But they're not. That's not biblical. God struck Saul with a malady. Came from him. Let's solve the issue. And so the suggestion comes, music. Music, well, that's a good idea. Then the suggestion comes to Saul. Let's find someone that can play for you. And Saul then gives the order. 
Yes, go out and find. All to be matched by the timely observation of this servant, this official. It all seems so natural, so random. There's nothing natural or random about it. This is the providence of God. This is how the pieces all fit together. And they fit together in your life the exact same way. What did he see? He saw a son of Jesse. Well, he has eight of them. I wonder which one it could be. The person that we're looking for has the perfect talent for the job that's needed. That's Proverbs 18, 16. The gift makes room for the man. And here's another detail that we do not want to miss. Notice he is Jesse, the Bethlehemite. But why is that significant? He's from a different tribe. He had altogether different tribe. Bethlehem's in Judah. Saul's in Benjamin. Those who are around Saul are people from Benjamin that he knows and knows well. People that he can rely on. People he can trust. This official saw somebody from a different tribe altogether. Now, there's no mass communication back here. This is an agrarian economy. Everybody's farmers. They work 12 months a year. They don't have time to go out on explorations and to look for this or that. And yet, this person, this person saw an individual from a different tribe altogether. I know an executive on the coast. He observed a young man a couple of years ago in his office. And this man on the coast promoted to the head of that division. And he reached out halfway across the country, made that phone call brought the man in and said, I want you to join my team here. That, that's a lot of people between those two places. That's the providence of God. That's the sovereignty of God. How do I know that for sure? Because the Apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, he told the Greek philosophers, God has determined the time and the places that all men would live. Now, that's no big deal for you at Believer's Chapel. But those men had never had a Bible. They had never heard the name Jesus Christ. They had never heard the revelation of God. What does Paul present before them? Very powerfully and boldly, Acts chapter 17, the sovereignty of God and His providence over their lives, whether they know it or not. And none of them did. But this God determines the times and the places that all men would live. So here we go. Let's get out your sheet with your questions. Your questions are on the left. Your little boxes are on the right. And here we go. I mean, you have to report to a superior. <coughs> you have identified a person and you want to look very smart because you're going to bring this person in to your group, or to His presence. So these are all the add-ons besides being able to play proficiently. Who is the man that desires, or who the king would desire to be in his company? 
Well, first, we have a powerful man, a man of war. So the young shepherd that was anointed by Samuel has grown up to some extent. I made the point back in verse 13 <coughs> that we had a gap between 13 and 14. Some time has occurred and David has grown. Someone had seen him with a proficiency for a weapon, a weapon in his hand. You don't have to be in your early 20s or mid 20s to be recognized as proficient. Nadia Comaneci was considered the greatest gymnast in the world, 1976, by scoring a perfect 10 at the ripe age of 14. In his middle teens, Tiger Woods was hitting a golf ball 300 yards. One college coach said of Tyler's Earl Campbell, he was so superior that he could skip college and go directly and make an NFL roster. Just the other day, I watched Joshua Galise, G-A-L-A-S-S-E, age 14, in a special performance of the Brussels Symphony. He played Vivaldi, concert concerto number four in F minor. I don't know what all that means. I just listened to the music. Sounds good. I wouldn't know if it were good or not, but the expert that listened said afterwards it was played flawlessly. I stood one hot afternoon on a practice field right next to, right next to a 17-year-old boy from Henrietta High School. I watched him throw a football with such power and accuracy. I just frankly had never seen anything like it. You might have heard of him. His name was Troy Aikman. God in His sovereignty gifts people with exceptional talent, and at an early age we recognize those talents. David was observed for what he was, a man with an exceptional gift and talent. And so, that's what is taking place. It amuses me reading the various commentaries, mostly liberals, and they try to explain away how this shepherd boy could have this proficiency. Certainly this occurred after uh, 1 Samuel 17 and him defeating Goliath. Just read the text. Just take the story as it comes. We think we're so much smarter than the Bible. Here's the next box, prudent in speech. Dr. Johnson called that the gift of utterance, the ability to speak. I never heard the brilliant scholar F.F. F. Bruce. He's often quoted. His prodigious mental capacities were set to all types of scholarly disciplines. Historian, biblical commentator, archaeologist, textual critic of the inspired language. What a mind this man had. I had a professor who talked about once hearing him. He said it was like eating cardboard without salt and pepper. He just didn't have the gift. Here's box number three. A man of form. Your translation may have handsome. You either got it or you ain't. Uh, I can just bear witness to you all by living with my wife. I have seen every Cary Grant movie that ever existed. <laughs> Both the silent ones and the, and the talkies. 
Uh, it's a testimony that she traded way down to get me. <laughs> but here's this word. It's used of Rachel, Genesis 29. It's used of Joseph, Genesis 39. It's used of the lovely Abigail, 1 Samuel 25. Here's the last box. And this one is probably the most important of them all. If you have the word for here, it's literally and. So that makes it a summary. And the Lord is with him. You can have all the gifts and all the talents and all the abilities, but if you don't have the Lord, you're going to waste your life. You're going to waste it. And here's why. Because you're going to spend all your days of your life living on your talent. And you were made for bigger things than that. Talent can make you wealthy. Talent can make you powerful. Talent can make you celebrity. But talent alone is bankruptcy before the living God. He's the one that gave you the talent in the first place. How could He possibly be impressed with you? I would suggest everyone listen to Mark's lesson last week, his excellent exposition, Wealth and Poverty, from Luke chapter 12. That text ends in verse 21 with these words, is not rich toward God. In other words, your talent at the window of heaven, the teller's window, your check doesn't cash. Talent doesn't do you any good before the living God. Look again, the Lord is with him. The Apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Follow me as I follow Christ. We all have fears that we run in. A cadre of individuals. Friendships, colleagues, associates, business partners, clients. You find a person that is following Christ and start observing them carefully. What is it that you find so beautiful, so lovely, so admirable about that individual? And you start imitating that as best you can. And most importantly, to pray that the Lord would put that in your own life as well. That's the attractiveness of Jesus Christ, my friends. Now verse 19. The open door. Well, it's just another ordinary garden variety day. And Saul sent messengers to Jesse. And just as profound as the verb to see is the verb to send in our text. Verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, Go, I will send you to Jesse. Then verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, Send and I will get him. And now right here, verse 19, Saul sent messengers. More about send later. <laughs> but like the federal government, it absolutely stops everything, doesn't it? It arrests our attention. 
Who could that possibly be? Oh, the federal government is at our door. Wonder what for? And like the federal government, they know everything. Look, your son's guarding the flock. But here's what I find rather striking. See, we skipped over it back in verse 13 initially because I knew we would address it here. Back in 13, we have the first mention of the name David in the Bible. So there it is for you leading your Bible quiz with your students. Where is the first mention of David in the Bible, we ask? 1 Samuel 16, 13. Good, you go to the head of the class. But verse 19, 19 here, is far, far more significant. Back in verse 13, it was our inspired historian telling us the story. But here, here, notice it's direct dialogue. Whose voice is it that gives the command? Why, Saul, that's your order. Your order yourself. It's your order to bring David into your inner circle. Saul, by his own decision, invites the very man that possesses the spirit that he once had. Thus, get this picture in your mind if you're observing it from the mouth of Saul's tent. Here comes the official or officials with this boy David. And we say, here comes the neighbor. That's 1 Samuel 15, 28. Here comes the neighbor that God has chosen that's better than you, Saul. Verse 20. Here Jesse gives honor to whom honor is due. Notice he sends gifts, food and drink. Jesse's a gracious man, and I think this puts an exclamation point upon that element of his character. But in reality, in reality, Jesse is sending a lot more than gifts, isn't he? That's what you do when you send your children out of your home and into a place. You're sending them out wherever they would go to be a blessing. And so, Permit me here with just a few moments left to step away from the text and the historical context for a moment and just say, I remind you all of a father who sent his beloved son not to be served, but to serve. That's the model and to give his life as a ransom for many. In a world that will be incredibly hostile, the Father sent the Son. Which is what Jesse is doing here, unbeknownst to him. He's sending his son, his eighth son, into a rather dicey situation. This man has an evil spirit indoors, right up here. And so I want to ask you younger parents, what are you doing to train your children for the evil that they are going to be encountering? We now have it in public schools. Imagine that. Mothers, what are you doing to train your daughters? The college campus is an exciting place. It's also a very dark place. 
Lots of darkness there. What are you doing today to train your children for that? So verse 21, let's think this through. With David's initial arrival, all seemed to be working so well. You see, loved, the real value of sending the godly child into a place. This word enters, came, gives us a new location. We've gone from Bethlehem to Gibeah. So, think about this. He comes to this place and he knows no one. He's from Judah, Bethlehem. These are all Benjamites around him. He doesn't know anyone. But that makes it all the more profound. Look at the word loved. It's not long before he settles in. And he is changing attitudes by his performance. That's a godly child. Before we close, let's observe the interplay. David came to Saul. David attended Saul. Saul loved David greatly. And David became a weapon bearer for Saul. Look at the style. The subject switched back and forth between two characters. David, Saul, Saul, David. And it's all quick tempo. Came, attended, loved, became. Became a word of transition. He didn't start by being an armor bearer. He started by playing the liar. But he promoted, he transitioned. And think of that first postcard back home. Dad, all is well. I've been promoted to armor bearer. Think the smile on Jesse's face. But that's all going to change, isn't it? See, things change in a hurry. That's where we're wise. Saul is going to go from first loving, and he will be is the first one mentioned in the family to love David. Then it's going to be Jonathan and the daughters. Everybody loves David. But Saul's going to change. And that's the lesson as we close. So in every relationship, we have to ask one question. Who changed? Who changed? Is it me? Is it them? The Apostle Paul gives us counsel. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. As it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You know, I pray for my enemies. I don't like to. I have trouble doing it, but I have learned something over time. Those who have taken advantage of me, lied to me, misrepresented me, I've learned something that God has exposed to me. My hypocrisies, my dark places, where I've been sinful and wrong. God has actually transformed me by doing that. God is always at work in every detail and that's the story this morning. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study. Thank You for these people that love to hear Your Word. Guide, guard, direct them. Bless their holiday season with their families and provide for them mightily in the year to come. And we ask all of this in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.